wonder we see so little of the life around us. Much of it is hidden, most of it defended, sometimes by poison, sometimes by stealth or strength or speed. And sometimes just looking dangerous for only an instant is as good as any of these. The natural world is full of disappearing acts and magicians. It's no accident there are so many. One of the best ways for an animal to stay alive is to look like what it isn't. In the next hour, we will journey from our own backyards to the far corners of both hemispheres. The ways that animals use visual confusion provide an insight into their perceptions of the world around them. Every environment is a crucible containing a unique set of ingredients for plant and animal design. In the tropics as well as the desert, life obeys the same natural laws. First among these laws is that any given species must live, adapt to change, and multiply according to the process of natural selection. It means that in each generation, the most fit are those who survive to breed. To see how natural selection works, we go first to the forests of North America, where a variation on the ancient game of hide-and-seek has been going on for the last 50 years. It's played by creatures familiar to most of us. Birds like blue jays do the seeking. They enforce the laws of natural selection. Moths like this panthea do the hiding. Fifty years ago, this species was nearly all pale because that shade was the most effective camouflage. There are three moths here. The dark one, just below and left of center, is easiest to see. Fifty years ago, if there were any dark ones at all, they made an easy mark for birds. Blue jays are omnivores, and moths form a part of their diet. So keen-eyed birds like this one have learned to spot conspicuous insects. But moths like this panthea escaped detection and so did their offspring, as long as the environment remained unchanged. But the environment did change. Throughout the 20th century, the soot of industrialism has been descending on city and country alike, slightly darkening the surfaces of many trees. Industrial pollution meant extinction for some species, but others have adapted. And one of these was the panthea moth. Before 1940, collections of pantheas contained only pale ones. But after 1940, dark ones began to be found. Soon there were areas where they comprised 80 to 90 percent of the population. They produced the black pigment melanin, and with it, they and their descendants thrived. A moth without the trait was without protection. Blue jays are adaptable generalists and learn quickly to uncover a failing camouflage. They are agents of natural selection.
Combined with sudden environmental change, they help to perfect the defenses of their own prey. Camouflage is effective, but are there times when it pays for an animal to advertise itself with bright colors? And if so, might it pay for another animal to imitate those colors? Let's look at the life stories of two familiar creatures. Under the leaves of milkweed plants is where monarch butterflies lay their eggs. The leaves of willow trees are sought by viceroy butterflies, and that's where they lay theirs. On the left is the viceroy, on the right, the monarch. When they hatch, the tiny eighth-inch caterpillars bear little resemblance to each other, but their lives are inextricably intertwined. As they eat, they grow and change. The viceroy caterpillar's blotches are not camouflage, but, as we shall see, more like disguise. As the monarch caterpillars grow, their rings become distinct, their colors brighten. The viceroy eats willow. The monarch eats only milkweed, a plant that contains a poison in its milky sap. What the caterpillar eats does it no harm, but it has become toxic, and the bright colors are a warning. The leaves of the willow tree contain no toxin, and therefore neither does the viceroy. But most animals won't eat it, because the caterpillar looks too much like a bird dropping. After three weeks of feeding, the monarch's time as a caterpillar is over. The same for the viceroy. It weaves a silk pad under a branch of the willow tree. When it's done, it anchors itself and hangs upside down. The monarch does the same thing. After about 24 hours, each one sheds its outer layer of skin and the process of pupation begins. What's underneath is a transitional form, a chrysalis. The outer case hardens in four hours, and the living thing within is being utterly transformed. What seem to be identical butterflies emerge from each chrysalis. The monarch on the right has kept its coloration, advertising its toxicity. But what about the viceroy on the left? Aptly named as a stand-in for the king, it wears the monarch's bright colors. Has it become toxic through metamorphosis? No, it just looks that way. Wherever the viceroy goes, it travels under false colors. The monarch travels under true ones. Does this resemblance do the viceroy any good? Recent research has shown that it does, because predators remember not to repeat unpleasant encounters. This blue jay, which eats panthea moths, has a taste for butterflies, too. But this one has never eaten monarch or viceroy. When presented here with a monarch, 
The naive jay catches it, dismembers it, and eats it. As we shall see later on in another sequence, birds are not born knowing how to hunt. They have to learn the hard way. After about 12 minutes, the milkweed toxin in the monarch begins to affect the jay. It could make the jay extremely ill, but it contains an emetic causing the jay to regurgitate before the poison does any real harm. After the blue jay recovers, if he's given a choice between the edible mimic, the viceroy, and the equally edible swallowtail, will he choose based on his memory of the monarch's colors? He eats the swallowtail, rejecting the viceroy. The jay cannot tell the model from the mimic, so he will now avoid both monarch and viceroy. Because of the predator's capacity to learn, the non-toxic viceroy has survived by trading on the reputation of the monarch. It pays to advertise. In the tropics of Central America, the game of hide-and-seek has Baroque variations unheard of in the temperate north. Even the trees seem menacing. They conceal a poisonous vine snake stalking its well-hidden prey. It waits, motionless as a branch. A thunder and lightning snake coils ready to strike. It vibrates its tail sounding like a rattlesnake, but it's harmless. Its aggressive behavior only a terrifying bluff. The shy coral snake is neither camouflaged nor aggressive. Its colors are a clear warning. Its venom is one of the most lethal in the hemisphere. But it has such small teeth, its bite is not always deadly. So, like the monarch, it can teach without killing. And like the monarch, wherever it occurs, it has mimics. In Texas, there is the gray-banded kingsnake. In the rainforests of Colombia, the South American milk snake. In the thickets of the American Deep South, the Louisiana milk snake. In southern Mexico, the Puebla milk snake. And in northern Mexico, the Sinaloan king snake. The most common pattern among coral snakes has the bands arranged in this order red, yellow, or white, then black. But even the experts have to remember the old saying, red next to yellow will kill a fellow. And for the harmless mimic below, red next to black is a friend of Jack. But the snake has to hold still long enough for you to count the rings and recite the poem. How would you choose? if you saw a flash of red, yellow, and black in the underbrush. From earliest childhood, we ourselves have been participants in many of nature's truth and advertising schemes. Most of us have been stung by bees, wasps, and hornets, once bitten, twice shy. 
so we give a wide berth to anything that reminds us of that painful experience. We think we recognize these insects as ones that will sting if annoyed. We react to the telltale colors with caution, as an insect-eating bullfrog will after it has learned its painful lesson. Or other insectivorous animals like chickadees and tree frogs. But let's look again. On the left is a harmless surfid fly. On the right, a genuine yellow jacket. Left, a fly. Right, a bumblebee. Left, another fly. Right, a honeybee. Like bees and wasps, ants are notoriously annoying. And when we see this one, we think we recognize it at once. It seems to have an ant's biting mandibles and an ant's sensitive antennae. But it's not an ant. It's not even an insect. It's an ant-mimicking spider. It trades on one of the more infamous reputations in nature, that of the ant, whose mandibles can inflict painful bites. On the left is the spider. On the right is the ant. The spider joins the viceroy and others that imitate aggressive or harmful animals. For this deception to work, there have to be many more unpleasant models than harmless mimics. Otherwise, the imposters would be discovered. It's a cover that works around the world. In South America, there's a frog so poisonous you shouldn't touch it. In one part of Central America, toxic grasshoppers. In another part of Central America, toxic caterpillars. This Australian caterpillar speaks for itself. Let's take a broader view and see how natural selection designs the appearance of communities of animals in two different environments. The first is in the desert of southern Arizona where conditions are harsh and food is scarce. Yet the land around the windmill conceals a great deal of life. On the gravel of this anthill, a horned lizard is almost invisible as it laps up the scurrying ants. There is one kind of camouflage that involves resembling parts of plants. This is not the stub of a broken twig. It's a tiny membracid bug. On another part of the same dead branch, a three inch walking stick. By contrast, this caterpillar's vivid colors are fair warning that it carries an effective defense. The praying mantis hunts among the trees and bushes here. It will eat caterpillars, but this one bites the mantis on the right foreleg, flails it with its foul-smelling tail appendages, and stands its ground. The mantis tries one more time, but is driven off by the aggressive caterpillar. It withdraws to consider other hunting grounds. The caterpillar's coloration is an honest announcement. The mantis must find something less well defended. Animals in this place are designed by each other and by the physical environment. Since the niche occupied by each species is different, the design of each is different. Each animal is a unique combination of stealth, speed, strength, size, and foraging behavior. 
Some live among the plants, some on the desert floor. Let's take a look at a few of the creatures that are found in the ubiquitous creosote bush and which appear to have been created in its very image. When this green walking stick moves, it looks like a twig swaying in the wind. At rest, it becomes a stick. Its twig-like leg joins the body, perfectly matching the color and texture of the bush. Even its head resembles a small bud. The praying mantis is a generalized predator. It has to know how to tell animal from vegetable, but here it all looks the same. Is it a stick or a walking stick? Is it a leaf or a green grasshopper with white stripes on its legs? On the way to the top branch of the bush, the mantis steps on the walking stick. It locates the leaf-like grasshopper and stalks after it. The mantis uses its antennae to verify that what it sees really is a grasshopper. The mantis hunts through these bushes like a panther in a jungle and is one of the selective pressures that perfects the camouflage of others. The longer a group of animals lives in a single environment, the more exquisite its disguise can become. The next environment is in tropical waters. Caribbean islands are comparatively simple ashore, but the surrounding sea abounds with animals with remarkable adaptations. The open ocean is patrolled by predators, but floating on its surface is a unique haven, a world within the larger world of the sea. Sargassum weed is a miniature seagoing jungle that conceals species found nowhere else on Earth. Many are hunters themselves, but they have only each other to eat. The sargassum fish is almost all mouth. It will even eat one of its own kind. The sargassum fish and other creatures that live here are all poor swimmers. But as long as they keep to the shelter of the weed, they are safe from the swift predatory fish that lurk in the water below. Tropical water is the home of the coral reef, perhaps the most intricate and least understood of all natural systems. A coral reef is a complex food web, top heavy with predators.
It is a kaleidoscope of life, full of the noise of animals communicating with each other. But the colors of the fish here can be misleading, like the false eye spots on the tail of the four-eyed butterfly fish. Or a perfection of camouflage, like the mottled markings of this flounder moving only its eyes and its gills. It can even change color if it swims to where the bottom looks different. This tiny shrimp hides unharmed on a sea anemone. Other creatures might die in contact with the stinging cells in the tentacles of the shrimp's host. But there is a theory that the shrimp may secrete a chemical disguise and that for the anemone, the shrimp isn't even there. And that is the main function of disguise, to convince the world you aren't there. Sometimes this crab has an unpalatable sponge on its back, so it won't be eaten. And other times it fashions its own costume out of whatever is at hand. There is a theory it is descended from a line of crabs that at first stored bits of food on themselves, a kind of portable larder. Then, as the theory goes, that behavior evolved into something deceptive. behavior evolves just as its form and color does. What was originally a way of storing food may also have served to hide the crab from predators. The ability to improvise an effective cover was favored by natural selection. Half a world away, on the coral reef of a Pacific archipelago, we will see that predators, too, practice deception. They can be elaborate and sinister. There are two fish here. One is a butterfly fish. The other is the shadowy form in back of it. It's an anglerfish. Its black eye watches for prey. Between its eyes, a short spine with a feathery lure on it. Below the lure, a huge mouth. Now in slow motion. The angler twitches its lure, attracting the attention of the butterfly fish. What we just saw happened in a fraction of a second. Let's watch it again, slowed down. The butterfly fish sees the lure and is attracted. It turns to get a better look. The angler's huge mouth opens explosively, sucking in prey and water alike. Some who have measured the speed of the angler's strike say it is the fastest in the vertebrate kingdom. It happens in four one thousandths of a second, and no fish within reach has a chance. There are less hazardous attractions on this reef, and one of them is the cleaner. It removes and eats the parasites from other fish, a beneficial function. It has a territory called a cleaning station, and fish like this yellow tang go there to have parasites removed. The wrasse performs a ritual display, hovering in the water, signaling to the tang it's ready to groom.
Lurking in a hole in the bottom is the cleaner Rass's double. It's called a saber-tooth blenny, and it takes advantage of the relationship between Rass and the fish they clean. The blenny is now near the cleaning station. The subterfuge begins. The blenny goes into a RAS act. Everything the blenny does makes it look like a RAS to the tang. But instead of the small RAS mouth, the blenny has the jaws of a miniature shark. The blenny moves in and bites at the tang. The blenny has a second chance. The tang isn't seriously injured, but its fin clearly shows the damage. Now the tang won't allow the mimic or the model to approach until it finds a new population of cleaner wrasse in another part of the reef. The blenny doesn't kill. It depends on a harvest from living fish. Like all mimics, the blenny is rare and plies his trade best from hiding while he waits for the uninitiated and the unwary. We're back in North America, over Minnesota. Each year, these woods fill with hungry birds foraging, among other things, for caterpillars, whose defenses can be more than a match for this onslaught. Caterpillars don't have much of a capacity to learn as individuals, but different species have developed elaborate form and behavior for staying alive. Many are messy eaters. Edible caterpillars try to stay hidden while they eat. Those that taste bad to birds let them know it with bright colors and can eat in full view with impunity. Damaged leaves reveal the whereabouts of caterpillars, though many are well camouflaged. Recent research has shown that birds, like this chickadee, can learn to read the leaves and forage where damage is the worst. It soon learns how to find food. As the branch shakes, this caterpillar instinctively recoils, disguising its form. But too late, the bird saw it move. This young red-winged blackbird has just left his nest, and he doesn't know how to hunt. He doesn't even realize that inches away, under the branch, there is a full meal, camouflaged to look like the branch itself. By summer's end, he will know the difference between branch and caterpillar, and he will forage successfully. Many caterpillars have ways of covering their tracks, of hiding the evidence they leave as they eat. There is one that feeds only on elm leaves with serrated edges. It is in the center of the picture. It places its own body in the space it has chewed out, the serrations on its back replacing the leaf's missing edge. The same for this one. 
It feeds on hornbeam. It resembles the dead edge of a leaf and has spots that mimic mold. This one feeds on aspen leaves, chewing half the leaf at night, then resting and feeding by day where it appears to replace the midvein. Big fast eaters like this three-inch hornworm eat small leaves symmetrically and devour them entirely, destroying the evidence in the process. They don't even leave a stem. One of the most ingenious is the little dagger moth caterpillar. It feeds on large leaves and can't finish them quickly. It hides behind the leaf, eating it symmetrically, and a bird watching for irregular damage might not look twice. When the leaf is too small to hide behind, it covers its tracks completely, clipping off the leaf and dropping the evidence to the forest floor, like those clipped by many others. It's a sign that there are caterpillars up there trying to cover their tracks. Many of these leaf clippers belong to a special group that feed by night, get rid of the evidence, then poise in plain view all day. They feed and hide on only one kind of plant. Their camouflage is as specialized as their diet. Anchoring a silk thread to a branch, this one cables itself into position so it can be rigidly supported like an upright twig while it waits for nightfall. Even this little thorn mimic, a membracid bug, can be fooled by these caterpillars. The resemblance between these caterpillars and the plants they eat is so good that if you find one on the ground, you can tell what leaves to feed it by what kind of a stick it looks like. These caterpillars are common in the woods of North America, but how many of us ever see them? But birds need to see them. If a young bird doesn't even know what to look for, or what is good to eat, how does he begin? He doesn't see the little green inchworm motionless in the middle of the picture, but pecks instead at anything that moves. There is an edible caterpillar on the edge of the leaf. When it moves, it gives itself away and becomes a target. The bird looks behind the leaf. Persistence pays, and the caterpillar is caught. The learning process has begun. The young redwing has much to learn. He must know how to penetrate camouflage, uncover disguise, and recognize warning coloration if he's going to survive. Some other by animals. appearance. But there's an animal that deceives the world with behavior alone. It's the hognosed snake. Even kittens have the blood of great hunters in their veins. This one is long on instinct, but short on experience.
The cobra act doesn't frighten the kitten away, so the snake gives up and pretends to die. The kitten seems to lose all interest. The snake has manufactured an awful smell with a scent gland in its tail, and that odor is its most effective line of defense. The cat finally decides to leave the snake alone. In fact, the smell is so bad, it attracts flies. When the kitten is gone and the coast is clear, the perfectly harmless snake revives and rights itself. Its behavior gives it a three-part defense that works. First it looks dangerous, then it looks dead. Only as a last resort did it abandon play-acting, and like a skunk, drive the kitten off with a foul smell. Most tactics work to avoid encounters, but some invite them. Australia, 12,000 miles away, is an island continent separated from the rest of the world. Mammals found here are rare or unheard of elsewhere. However, the insects here have many close relatives in other parts of the world. This three-inch spiny leaf insect belongs to a huge family found throughout the tropics. It is related to New World walking sticks and its camouflage is just as effective. It feeds by night and hangs motionless and virtually invisible while the sun is up. Bad-tasting caterpillars move in a group, as they do elsewhere. It's a spectacle that predators remember and learn to avoid. But we are here because of a very different sort of strategy, one that's practiced by a plant. It's the Cryptostylus orchid, and it's pollinated exclusively by this ichneumonid wasp. The reproductive system of this plant manufactures a scent that is a copy of the scent produced by the female ichneumonid wasp when she is ready to mate. The scent is such a powerful stimulus that the male tries to mate with the flower. The orchid's pollen sacs are sticky and become attached to the abdomen of the wasp. This is only the first step. The scent is persuasive enough for the wasp to try it again. The sensitive antennae pick up another whiff of the aroma, and he follows it to another flower. The seduction works again, and the pollination is successful. The wasp gets nothing from this, the orchid, everything. The natural laws that develop this relationship produce variations on the theme in other parts of the world as well. Orchids grow here in Spain too, and they are no less devious than in Australia. Spring comes half a year later here than down under, and with it come the usual bloom of flowers and the usual legions of insects. As they forage for food, beetles and bees, flies and others randomly pollinate the blossoms.
The orchid in this story is called Ophrys speculum. The warm spring weather awakens male wasps of the genus Campsoscolia. This male answers the same call that beckons his distant Australian relatives, but the females of his species are still buried, and he follows a false scent. For the wasp, this orchid not only smells right, it also has wings, a head, and a shiny abdomen covered with fine hair. In fact, this orchid is so convincing that the wasp performs the standard courtship maneuvers before attempting to mate. The orchid fits the wasp so perfectly that the pollen sticks to his head a genetic message he will unknowingly carry to another orchid. When he tries to mate with a second flower, he pollinates it, transmitting the orchid's genes instead of his own. In fact, if you place a female wasp next to Ophrys speculum, the males can't seem to tell the difference at first. The orchid blooms two weeks before the females emerge, so males readily fall for the harmless scheme that has become the orchid's guarantee of another season. In the swamps of Florida, hidden below the water hyacinth, there is a trap of a more sinister kind. It's the alligator snapping turtle, its form only discernible when it moves. At rest, it is almost invisible. It lives on fish like these small shiners that cruise about in the dim waters. They are foraging for small organisms like worms. People use worms for bait, but we are not the only ones that angle for fish with bait. This is a worm mimic tongue inside the trap-like mouth of the turtle. It will entice for hours, waiting for fish that pass too close or hesitate when the lure catches their attention. This turtle belongs to an ancient order of reptiles. They can get to be 150 pounds, growing huge on the gullibility of fish and the bait we ourselves have found so reliable. In the gathering twilight in the swamp near the snapping turtle, the animals that live by night are ready to appear. Firefly signals form a complex and precise language that males and females use to locate each other for mating. 
This is a Photurus A male. And like all fireflies, he has a white organ in his abdomen that produces light chemically. His sexual flash looks like this. When shown on an oscilloscope, it has a unique profile and sound. The male of another species has a flash with a different pattern and sound. This is the Photurus A female. When the male flashes, she responds like this if she is ready to mate. Her organ has twin lights. The Photurus A male is beginning to search for a mate. He may have noticed the correct flash below him in the grass. He makes his sexual search flash. His is the first. The second should be the female of his species. But it isn't. It's another female impersonating the code of the Photurus A female. Her name is Photurus versicolor and she has quite a repertoire of impersonations. She will respond to males of several different species. For example, this is a Photinus mcdermati male. His sexual search flash looks like this. The first signal is his, the second pair is Versicolor's impersonation of his female but back to the Photurus A male. He flashes the imposterous answers as before. He flashes one more time, she answers. The scope records his sexual search flash and then a series of extremely bright flashes. They have nothing to do with mating though. Versicolor was hunting for food. She will entice and eat several kinds of males. To understand this mimicry, science deciphered firefly language. Because this deception is based on dots and dashes of light, it is the purest kind of mimicry. Physical appearance plays no part. All that's needed is a code that works in the dark. The natural world is a babel of tongues. Animals gather information with five, sometimes six senses. Each of these senses is sharp enough to penetrate imperfect disguise, but each of these senses can also be deceived. In the wild places of the world, few stratagems are overlooked. The process that leads to camouflage also leads to the opposite of camouflage. Hunters are on the cutting edge of natural selection. Coloration and behavior are not planned by individuals. They evolve over millions of years and continue to change according to mutation and environmental pressures. Animals have a mandate to penetrate each other's disguises. 
As they enforce the laws of evolution, they continue to design each other's deceptive strategies, as they have from the beginning.